subscription to hope that you enjoyed this rare and infamous moment that combines a first-rate disaster with genuine historical significance. But now it's time to take a deep breath and get those cameras out as we prepare to temporally reset you to one of the most fantastic catastrophes in history. Are you ready? Everyone and welcome back to the Time Shifters podcast. This is your host Christopher, and here as always, my good friend Tom. Tom, how the heck have you been? Oh, not too bad. It's very good. wet these days. <laughs> it has been very wet in the Midwest. A lot of rain, some really good storms, a few tornado warnings and watches and stuff going on. And supposedly, we're supposed to have some more rain tonight. But I don't know how bad or how much. So if you start hearing any rumbling in the uh, recording, <laughs> it's not anyone moving furniture. <laughs> I, I, either that or he'll be completely cut off and I'll take on the show from here. So, <laughs> yeah, may have to, may have to. Ah, I've been watching a few things, but uh, have you been up to anything interesting? Uh, I've been trying to catch... Uh, I'm only... Th- three episodes into Prime's Fallout series, which we'll discuss a little bit more later in the show. Absolutely will, um, yes. But other other than that, life has been uh, pretty much, uh, I have more home renovations going on, so lots of moving my life around in very tiny spaces. Okay, so if you if you hear rumbling on the recording, <laughs> it could be Tom moving furniture. <laughs> there could be a little bit of that. Especially since, actually, I'll probably sound a little better right now because I'm not in a cavernous room. <laughs> yeah, you got a really great za- sound absorber right behind you there. and, and the... Nothing like my mattress sitting literally behind my head. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, can we uh, move that in there every time that we record? That'd be great. It, it has given me some thoughts on, <laughs> on, on some <laughs> thing I might do for us. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I finally got around to watching Mar- the Marvels. Okay. I'm sorry. <laughs> it was it was fine. It was okay. Uh, there's a few moments that just bring the film to a screeching halt, which they could have shortened the film a little bit and cut out things like the uh, singing planet and that sort of thing. Yeah. The, you know, the song and dance number in the middle of the film and... No, 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 no. I, I, I'm going to take that back. Actually, I like the Marvels. Uh, okay, I, for some reason, I, my head was all over Eternals. <laughs> oh yeah, no, that was boring. <laughs> it was just straight up dull. Um, I think at this stage with the Marvel movies, anyone that comes with any hate, it's not that they're bad. It's just they're repetitive. Yeah. I, yeah, exactly. It, it was nothing new and original in this. F- in this one no not really i mean i have no problem with the cast i have no problem with women superheroes on on the screen which i know there was a lot of feedback on unnecessarily um none of that was any of the issue it's just it's very marvel is very formulaic at this point and it's kind of like i can almost set my watch to the things that are going to happen in a marvel movie when did it really happen that the Nick Fury of the Marvel movies turned into the movie's comic relief? Yeah, see, th- that, that's that been a more recent development. Um, what's his name? Taki um, Watiri, or uh, I, 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 I'm going to put, I'm butchering his name. Take. Damn it! I had it. Until, ah. <laughs> I, I had it until you said it. <laughs> I ruined him. <laughs> but anyways, ever since Taika Waititi, I think so, sounds good. <laughs> <laughs> so sorry, everyone. Yes, uh, absolutely. Bad geeks. Bad geeks. Uh, the, the funny uh. thing is, I've seen it a thousand times, and I still I can literally have it in front of me and still not say it right. <laughs> so, at any rate. Um, He's been since his presence in the Marvel universe. It's been a little hit or miss. He introduces some humor and all that, but now I think because he has at the stage that he has, they're trying to carry it through. No matter who's directing at this stage, 
Mm-hmm. And, and I'm like, it, part of what made the Marvel stuff so good at the beginning, while there was always that sense of a little bit of a sense of humor, it kind of took itself seriously. It, this was real stuff happening. It just happened to be the birth of all these superheroes and all that. And then we got into, but by around now, the ever since, uh, I mean, Guardians of the Galaxy first introduced the notion of some humor, but then when he was directing, like, uh, uh, the Thor um, Ragnarok movie and the yeah. stuff that came after that, it just the comedy seemed to start trying to take the forefront and you lost the seriousness of the story you're trying to tell. So it's taking Mm -hmm. a little wind out of the sail. You're not getting that suspenseful vibe. I mean, they nailed it when they did the, uh, the Avengers series and you actually end a movie with a bad guy winning. (laughs) Like, right. uh, Like, okay, (laughs) this is all re like you're in this. You're like driven. And now it's just all funny. <laughs> well, and you go back to like Iron Man and, and Captain America, and you got Nick Fury, and he's practically like the Batman of the Marvel Marvel universe. Yeah. He shows up out of nowhere. Yeah, he he, he, he knows looks everything. like he knows everything. He looks like he could kick anybody's butt. Yeah, and now. He's Mr. Softy Even, all the time. <laughs> he's Mr. Softy. He's he, he's cuddling with the, the the weird cat. He's making jokes, and and that goes back to even I think the uh, the Captain Marvel movie mm-hmm. when he was like the sidekick through the film. Yeah, no pre pre uh, ruler of uh, <laughs> of Shield. Of Shield, <laughs> right? So I just yeah, it's it's weird for me. I feel like they took a character that was cool and they've tried to make him fun. <laughs> I'm not sure if that works for me. Well, and it, I don't know that you've watched any of the side series stuff, but uh, yeah, they had uh, that Secret Invasion uh, one, which was entirely a Nick Fury driven storyline. And even though that was supposed to be taken seriously, they softened him up so much, you just kind of like, it didn't hit right. Yeah. But anyway, overall, yeah, Marvels was was okay. Yeah, um, I liked all the characters. Sure. I just kind of want them in a different movie. Kinda, yeah. Oh, I was going to point out at least uh, for for Marvel, the other thing that they they keep doing almost to their detriment. I I like it to a point, but I think they're carrying it through too much. Is I'm okay with the notion that the bad guy is only the bad guy because everyone kind of disagrees with the approach. Um, Mm -hmm. But what they want to accomplish is not necessarily a bad thing. Um, Thinking of Thanos trying to... um, He he recognizes a universe that's consuming itself, so he thinks half the population solve the problem. Um, Right. Could have thought of double the stuff... (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's true you've got he the could have snapped his fingers and everything. easily made everybody's life a paradise instead of murdering half the universe but you know pros and cons so right <laughs> but at any rate that there's always uh, they're they're trying to build in a reason for the bad guy to be who they are um and it's not always driven by evil per se um mm-hmm. and and in the Marvels, that was the same deal with that particular uh, bad guy. She was trying to overcome something that happened to her world, but her approach was just to take it out on a bunch of other worlds. Right. So, too far the other way, but uh, there that's the trend. So, like I said, that whole you can set your watch to it. The same things keep happening in each movie. <laughs> Yeah, it's a good point. Yeah, the woman's looking out for for her world, so she goes to steal all the other worlds. And yeah, the solution could have been just picking up a phone and going, hey, Captain Marvel. Yeah, you could screwed you, everything could you, up. Can you come you fix it? You screwed this up. Could you come and help fix it? Yeah. <laughs> oh, sure. Be right there. See, I'm waiting for the one movie that, and it doesn't have to be a Marvel movie, but the movie that turns everything on its head and actually approaches the 
the reasonable, logical thing and has everything okay and working out. Because <laughs> I realize that's not a super suspenseful movie, but I think these days we kind of need a little more of that. <laughs> it would be a change of pace for sure. Change gears a little bit. Um, just some of the stuff that I've been up to in addition to the Marvels. Mm -hmm. uh, a while back, there was a, a meme floating around that kind of had the... Uh, Godzilla eras okay, uh, yes. li listed out in, um, you know, by film and, you know, the Showa, the Heisei Millennium, et cetera, et cetera. Problem is this meme was a little hard to read. I could not find uh, like a, a good, large, high resolution version of it. Mm -hmm. Cause I thought that's really cool. So I went and made my own. Yes. And posted that to the, to the Facebook group. And, um, I posted it to, um, Oh, I think where I first, saw that meme was i think in a, a, a godzilla subreddit yeah so i posted it in there too and reddit's a great place to get advice on uh, edits and changes <laughs> <laughs> so i so i did go and, and and edit and add a few things and now i think i'm it's not quite done i think i'm going to tweak it a little bit more because yeah. because this thing added in the uh kong films yes I'm thinking I'm going back and adding in like the early appearances of uh, Rodan and Mothra. Okay. Back in Showa era. Yeah, yeah. Anything that actually ties into the whole kind of Toa movie monster line. Yeah, the overall yeah, Godzilla. everything that ties back to Godzilla. Yeah, exactly. So I'm still tweaking that, but doing that and working on this thing and everything did get me in the mood for a little Godzilla film fun. And what I haven't watched in a long time is the Heisei Godzillas. Mm -hmm. So I, I threw in uh, Godzilla vs. Mecha Godzilla from 1993. Mm -hmm. uh, got the Blu-ray, checked it out. First time I've watched it on Blu-ray. I'd only seen it on like DVD prior. Okay. They apparently did a new... Uh, uh, I didn't feel like reading it, so I watched the, uh, the dubbed version. Yeah. And they apparently did a new dub for this release, and it was a little weird. It wasn't bad, but they decided to go back to what is apparently the original name of Rodan and, Jap and the Japanese film. It's more like Radon. Okay. But they changed it to Rodan when it was imported to the States to not confuse us with, like, the gas. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and so when I first heard it on the in this film, I'm thinking, well, they screwed that up. What are they doing? <laughs> I didn't realize that. I had to go go back and uh, it, a little bit of research. And, oh, apparently that's the that's proper pronunciation. <laughs> interesting. Yeah, I had no idea. It was an interesting choice. And it it was really a little off-putting. <laughs> all these people say, oh, that red on. The what? Who? <laughs> That's too funny. Now, I can hang with you on the Godzilla front because I, I did actually almost blank out that not only I, I, I finally caught Godzilla minus zero. Minus one. Minus one. I keep doing that. <laughs> Why do I keep doing that? Godzilla minus one. But even like a week before that, I had caught the new Godzilla Kong movie. Oh, nice. I haven't seen it yet. <laughs> and, well, I will never do spoilers, but uh, the funny thing is what would likely become most people's critiques uh, of that one, because it, the monsters are for, in the forefront. They are the characters. This is very little to do with the humans. Yeah. There is human presence, and, and it, but the thing of it is, is as it was goofy. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not even going to undersell it. It's a goofy movie. But it feels like old 70s Godzilla. Right. Okay, interesting. Uh, I mean, you've got the... Um, you've got the Asian cultural element tied to Mothra. Um, you've got, uh, like, the... The pretty little girl that will make Mothra do whatever Mothra does to save the world. Um, there is a, a there is that element in this. Um, Godzilla and Kong are playing off each other very much like you might have thought of Godzilla and Kong in the seventies movies. 
it, it's almost that goofy. Uh, there's all sorts of just weird, crazy elements. And I'm watching it and I'm going, this is ridiculous. But I'm like, but this is a Godzilla movie. This is this is what it used to be. <laughs> I mean, the, the kind of thing, and the way, it, it, it's even in the trailer, the, the whole scene where they're running side by side, and Godzilla might as well be a guy in a suit, because he's got full-length arms and full-length right. legs, and despite his ginormous size, he is hauling ass like, <laughs> like, like, like he's a sprinter. <laughs> and you're like, you're like, I want to pick on this, but then I also remember Godzilla doing flying kicks. And, right. <laughs> and, and, or or flying by his atomic breath. <laughs> yep. So I'm like, I can't pick on anything they're doing. This is all the stuff that you loved as a kid watching a Godzilla movie. So I'm like, I, you nailed it. <laughs> You're all in. All right. I'm looking, yeah, I'm looking forward to seeing it. It is a very different film from something like Godzilla minus one, but I it I, is yes. And, and but what did you think of minus one? Oh, minus one, uh, it, it, it was like a life changer kind of movie. I mean, first off, uh, watching the Japanese culture be very real about itself, mm-hmm. while they make a movie about one of their top characters, and and still very much, I, I've always often read this. Uh, in America, we see Godzilla as a hero kind of character. In Japan, they still very much see him as a monster. Mm-hmm. <laughs> he is not the good guy. <laughs> so even if he kind of starts slightly swaying that way, they don't want him around. <laughs> right. <laughs> he is not welcome. So so watching this movie was insane. Uh, I mean, the even watching Godzilla kind of evolve, during that, that you get the smaller version of him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, right away, right after World War II's ending, um, but the whole story, the human story, you could have almost taken Godzilla out, and it's still been a fantastic film. That's what I think I liked most about it mm-hmm. is it wasn't just a good Godzilla film; it was just a good film. Yes. Yes, no, I, I, and it's one of those where um, it had that right balance between the human story that needed to be there um, and the monster story that you, you really kind of come for. Um, but I have, this movie captured what you kind of always wanted out of Godzilla from his sheer raw destructiveness. Like, mm-hmm. They've we've always lovingly referred to it as his atomic breath. It's an atomic breath in this movie. Right. <laughs> that thing goes off. Everything in front of it is done. <laughs> like, that's insane. The first time he did it, I like, holy crap. <laughs> that was nuts. So the effects are amazing. The, the, the monster is great. They did some really cool stuff with the trying to at least explain some of the more odd elements of Godzilla, like like when he seems to always be able to stand up in water that is way too deep for him to stand up there. <laughs> they gave it a shot, at least, or at least speculated. Yeah. So, Yeah, I'm looking forward to uh, that one coming out on Blu-ray, because uh, I did not get to the theater for a third time to see the Godzilla minus one minus color. Yes, I really want to see this thing in black and white. Yeah, no, that would be kind of cool. Yeah, yeah. Looking forward to that. And still no release date as of recording. (laughs) Uh, They have a date for uh, the Japanese release, which I don't have in front of me. It's uh, it's coming up this summer. Yeah. But nothing for the U.S. And it's like, why are you doing this to (laughs) us? (laughs) Uh, Because they can. (laughs) Yes. Because the U.S. has its... Godzilla movies, we yeah. have ours. <laughs> and, and, and don't make me import this thing. <laughs> and, and, and as much as I've liked the the current U.S. run of Godzillas, they're 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 entertaining, they're watchable, they're decent. Monarch is a is a fun series. Uh, I I appreciate how they've managed to build a little world out of these. Very good. 
Godzilla minus one is the king. <laughs> yeah. Oh no, absolutely. I, I I think even people that aren't Godzilla fans could watch Godzilla minus one and walk away going, oh no, that was really good. Yeah. No, because uh, again, all the Godzilla stuff aside, the uh, the story of a kamikaze pilot that that ca- chickens out, he chickens out. I, I I was going to try to go with something a little softer, <laughs> but <laughs> but yes, no, he chickens out, and it seems to be kind of a pattern of his life, and it's a thing that he is wrestling with, and he's wrestling with it in a very. Um, Japanese approach. Yeah. No, it was really good. I'm glad you finally got a chance to watch oh, it. Oh, yeah, no. I was thrilled, and it was great. I loved it. My wife and I found something on, uh, I guess it was on Freebie. Yeah. Which is, you know, I don't know why Amazon has Freebie, because now there's ads on Amazon, but, yeah. you know, whatever. We've started watching... Um, the old Peter Gunn series from the 50s, 1958, 59. Okay. You probably know, yeah. you know the Peter Gunn theme yeah. more no, than absolutely. you know. But I don't, yeah. can't say I've actually watched any of that. We are amazed at how ahead of its time this series is. Oh, really? Believe me, this series, first of all, it's great because they're only like 26 minutes. So it's quick. Yeah. It, you're in, you're out. So it's really tight. The characters and the writing, um, it was created by Blake Edwards, who goes on to do, I mean, tons of amazing things, the least of which is the Pink Panther series right. of films. Uh, the writing in this thing is astonishing. The acting is fantastic. Uh, Craig Steven, Stevens plays Peter Gunn. Of course, we saw him as the head of Condor when we started our <laughs> series this year. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but he's phenomenal, and it's... This is the Rockford Files. Nice. In a way, you know, if Rockford was not the hard up private eye, yeah. you know, living in a trailer, change it that he's a uh, a a well to do uh, private eye <laughs> who you know lives in a nice pad and likes cool jazz. <laughs> but as far as like attitude yeah. and the type of trouble he gets into. It's absolutely the Rockford Files. This is James Garner. There are so many like cop shows in in the or detective shows in the seventies that are like direct ripoffs of Peter Gunn. Well, yeah, I mean, there's a reason that <laughs> there's a reason that theme song has stuck around for so long. <laughs> yeah, well, we're just it's just astonishing how how kind of violent it is. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, the the premiere opens with like someone hanging someone to make it look like a suicide oh, geez. and you're like this is how you're starting the series <laughs> <laughs> in the 50s and then peter and his girlfriend not wife girlfriend i don't think anyone was sitting there thinking that they have separate beds <laughs> yeah. it is very sexual nice <laughs> it is very sexually charged and it's like it's wow <laughs> it's a lot of fun it's a fun series well and, and knowing the time period it sits in and all that clearly this paved the way for a lot of, of what was to come yeah oh absolutely but yeah i think that's it for me which is plenty oh yeah no um yeah and i don't really have, other than the godzilla stuff and all that's that's what's been going on otherwise i just filler stuff while you work around the house <laughs> yep exactly okay well let's go ahead and take a break then we'll listen to a promo for another podcast and when we be and when we get back we jump back to 1975 to talk about a boy and his dog Hi, I'm Jeff Owens. And I'm Richard Chamberlain. And we want you to join our club, the Classic Horrors Club. Every month, Richard and I host the Classic Horrors Club podcast, where we talk about our favorite subject, horror movies. Some of them are classics. We all go a little mad sometimes. And some definitely aren't. What you see is real. 
What's done is done, and what I've done is right. It's the work of science. But we love them all the same. We also have special theme months where we highlight the legendary stars. And we head to the drive-ins of the past every summer for exciting double and triple features. Hi, I'm Chili Dilly, the personality pickle. And we even have occasional guests. My obsession, and it is truly an obsession, I suppose, of Frankenstein, the true story, dates back to when it first aired in two parts on NBC in 1973. So join the fun and listen to the Classic Horrors Club podcast today. Hosted by SoundCloud, we're available wherever fine podcasts are found. And for even more fun, check out the video companion on our YouTube channel. And remember, we sincerely appreciate your patronage and hope we've succeeded in bringing you an enjoyable evening of entertainment. Magnificently inspired, Richard Eder of the New York Times says, brilliantly grotesque, The Austin Sun, this may be the best science fiction film ever made. and his dog, a film that has become a cult legend. Right now I'm hungry and I want to get laid. That's what you always say. You go find a chick and I'll hustle us up some food. I can't do good work when I'm hungry. You ain't pulling that crap on me again. And you can shove that part about how you lost the ability to hunt for food when you learned how to talk. No food, no females. After World War IV, your dog will tell you what to do, how to laugh, how to love, how and who to kill. That stupid broad. <laughs> you're so funny when you're sexually frustrated. Damn it. How in the hell am I going to nail her in there? Simple. Stop shaking like a leaf and go do it. If you continue to find the food for your dog, he will find you a woman. He is the only one who can. Give him the girl. We stay. Now, you got any helpful suggestions? Yes, pull up your pants, Romeo. In the future, your dog will tell you how to survive. Or you will die. A woman can't get pregnant every once in a while. We need new blood. Horse manure. You mean you want me to knock up your broad? Lack of respect, wrong attitude, failure to obey authority. I'll get the dramatic catch out of your voice and tell me how she's going to carry her share of the load up here. Tell me how we're going to fight her. All right, up. okay, okay, just don't hang her. Harangue, not hang her. I don't care whatever the hell it is. You just knock off the crap and we can forget the whole stinking... Well, maybe we should, you simple dumb putz. What the hell's a putz? What's a putz? Is that something bad? I bet it is. It's some bad. You, well, I'll tell you, you better watch your stinking mouth. Or I'm going to kick you in the butt. If you can imagine an excuse for World War IV, you will understand a talking dog. Try to get back as quick as I can. Will you wait? For a while. Then over the hill. And I'll miss you, big. I'll really miss you. L.Q. Jones, A Boy and His Dog. A film that has become a legend by word of mouth. Rated R. Before we start our discussion of A Boy and His Dog from 1975, I wanted to throw out a little bit of a trigger warning. At several points during the conversation, we do discuss sexual assault. It is very much a part of the film. So, we had to talk about it, but if you're sensitive to such things, just fair warning. Thanks, everybody. A Boy and His Dog was directed by L.Q. Jones, who also wrote the screenplay, and it stars Don Johnson, Suzanne Benton, Tim McIntyre, Voices Blood, and we have a special appearance by Jason Robarbs. In this dark comedy science fiction tale, based on the award-winning 1969 novella by Harlan Ellison, young Vic and his telepathic dog Blood travel the wastelands of America after the Fourth World War. Vic, lacking any formal education and with little understanding of ethics and morality, and just wants to eat and have sex, uh, Blood, despite being very well-read and intelligent, uses his telepathic abilities to track down women for Vic in exchange for food, as he has lost the ability to hunt for himself. While doing so, he also tries to be the teacher to Vic in the hopes of someday making him a better man. When Blood detects a woman at the local outdoor movie house, the two track her down to abandon YMCA. And Vic learns her name is Quilla June Holmes, a young girl from a place called Down Under. After fending off an attack from a roving gang, which gravely injures Blood, Vic follows Quilla to the portal that leads to Down Under. 
Blood stays behind, warning Vic that it's a bad idea. Well, down under is a strange, self-sufficient biosphere called Topeka that has been modeled to be a surreal vision of 1950s America. The men of Topeka have become sterile, and they need the occasional male from the outside to use as breeding stock. What at first sounds like a dream come true for Vic turns into a nightmare of imprisonment, and he and Quilla run to escape the Topeka hell to the refuge of the wasteland. I think, weirdly enough, this film is a perfect follow-up to our last episode yeah. for a number of reasons. Oh, yeah. The first of which I thought was interesting that you talked about uh, starting the Fallout series on Amazon Prime. Yeah. And as it turns out, the creators of the Fallout video game were at least in part inspired by this film. Absolutely. (laughs) The whole idea of that weird 50s uh, in the future sort of thing. Here's the thing. You didn't even need to tell me you looked that up for me to believe that that was... (laughs) Like, I hadn't done that research, and that's literally what I was going to say. There's no way the people that created Fallout had not seen this, or at least the source material. I also thought, too, you know what? We just watched Children of Men. Yes. Which took place in Britain, which was the last, you know, refuge of civilization. Yeah. I know where you're going with this. The world has gone (laughs) sterile. And I think, you know what? This is what was happening in America. (laughs) Yeah. uh, uh, Yeah. The minute you even said that, I knew you were going there because this was the part that 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 was the part that we discussed last time where we said they couldn't show the U.S. version of what happened because this was it. (laughs) Yes, I I think this is exactly what was going on in the United States at this time. <laughs> yes, just rampant stupidity. <laughs> <laughs> now, this was a first time watch for both of us. Yes. <laughs> it's one that's been on my radar for years. I've it's always come up in in, in books and lists mm-hmm. about um, you know classic sci fi's or or uh, weird sci fi's or you know what have you and. So, yeah, I've been wanting to watch it forever, so it was great to finally have an excuse to watch it. As we discussed a little bit at the end of the show last time, the kind of weird independent 70s sci-fi and horror Mm -hmm. is a little bit of a sweet spot for me. Yeah. Even when, like, the films are kind of awful, I still kind of enjoy them because I feel like they're just some guy with a camera who he and his friends got together to make a movie sort of thing. This one's a little better quality than that, mm-hmm. but it's still definitely kind of in that vein. Yeah, but see, uh, after I watched this film, I had that feeling like, what What did I watch? Uh, <laughs> like, I, I couldn't peg how I feel about it, but the more that I let it sit with me, The part that will put you off about this film is some of the content of the film. Just the notion that uh, all all, there's there's men are basically hunting women, more or less. Um, Mm -hmm. It is not good to be a woman and it is not good to be out in, in the open. And and that is made clear in all this. But if you can get past the rape and murder and the generalness of this this is good. Yeah, there's so much about this film that there's some really great bits in this film. And here, it wasn't the maybe not the strongest cast. I mean, this has got to be Don Johnson's practically first paid gig, if not very, very not close. Not his, not his first, but it very early in his. Yeah, career. this is very early in his career. So I mean. Not that I account Don among the great thespians of the world, but uh, clearly not <laughs> polished by any stretch at this stage. But it kind of works. Um, so what's holding this thing really together is the, the script and the dialogue. I mean, given what they're talking about, it's talked about in a way that that's actually more intelligent than I think you you even realize as you're taking it in. Well, as I said, it was based on a novella by Harlan Ellison. Yes. 
And from what I, I've not read the actual no. source material, but what I have read about it, it's a very close adaptation. There's very little difference between his novella and the film. We're talking Harlan Ellison, incredible uh, author, mm -hmm. sci-fi uh, television writer, Hugo Award winning. I think even uh, this novella is a Hugo Award winning uh, a story. So yeah, no, it's not like they just some guy in a, in, in a coffee shop scribbled a bunch of ideas down on a napkin right. or something and made a movie about it or, or, or anything. Right, and that that's what's really a, any of the low budgetness of it, any of the um, idiosyncrasies. No matter how you feel about the content, that that strong base it comes through. And, it's hard not to kind of enjoy it. And weirdly, there's nothing in this film. Everything kind of has a reason why it is the way it is. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, the, the surface is pretty much all inhabited by males. Because Mostly I don't know if it's really... what the males are doing. <laughs> that, and apparently, I think it's explored a little bit more in the novella, the idea is the men went off to war... Mm -hmm. And all the women and children went into the bunkers. Yep. So all that's left on the surface is mostly men. Right. Because keep in mind, this was written in the 1960s when, you know, you didn't have you know, woman soldiers, you know, going off into battle. And you can also chalk a lot of things up to the sort of alternate universe that this takes place in. Mm -hmm. Because this is sometime after... The Fourth World War. <laughs> it's the Fourth World War because Kennedy is not assassinated and apparently uh, elected president three more times. Right. <laughs> well, and World uh, War Three takes place in 1950. Yes, yeah, so there's like a a, a, a kind of combination where the Cold War heats up and cools off over a, over decades. Yes. Of you know, like conventional war, warfare. Yeah. That lasts you know for, for several decades. And then finally, someone pushes the final button, and so war, war, World War Four, I think they said, lasts like five days. Actually, and, and, and listeners, if you know this and don't, feel free to comment. Uh, but uh, I'd actually be curious at what stage um, we, the world, called what happened post World War II, um, the Cold War. Mm. So. I don't know when that term was coined. And given that this is a film from 75, the source material probably much earlier than that. 69, I want to say. Yeah. So the notion of describing World War Three as World War Three instead of the Cold War, maybe that's because the Cold War hadn't been coined at the time the material was written. I think the term was older than that. Is and it? I definitely think in the film, they talked about the cold war war and the, I forget how they put it, but effectively over a course of decades, it was cold and hot yes. over and over again. Yeah. They mentioned that, but I just, I like kind of the idea that maybe that's what they're referring to as world war three is just the cold war in their world, because since that was 1950, um, that that's different tone than what we actually have gone through. From just a, a real quick Google kind of wiki search or whatever, the, the Cold War is considered about two years after the end of World War II. So 47 is when, uh, the, till 91 to the fall of the Soviet Union, but you can... It's probably a little wishy-washy about whether or not that really ended a, a, any Cold War. But yeah. so, yeah, so I, I don't know. There's definitely an alternate universe sure. sort of thing going on in this film. With uh, and I, I thought it was kind of fun that it's really only brought up because Blood is teaching Vic, uh, okay, you know, tell me the president's in order. And he goes through and then Kennedy, Kennedy, okay. Kennedy. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, no, that that was fun. Um, since we're on the topic uh, of uh, blood and, and teaching him things, the, the 
it didn't need to be inserted, but I was kind of hoping for a little bit more on why he's a telepathic dog. <laughs> <laughs> or why that's even a thing for dogs. Like, it's implied that other dogs are like this, too. Yeah, it's you couldn't quite figure out if we were meant to believe other dogs could communicate with other people. Because apparently uh, Vic and Blood could communicate with each other, but no one else could hear Blood. Right. So, yeah, I don't know... <sighs> It, it just is. I mean, they sort of tried to explain it when Vic is explaining to Quilla that, uh, yeah, blood, because we just think alike and we're on the same wavelength or something. And, like, that's it. That's as close as you get. Which, which if, I, if I may for a moment, does blood talk at all? Ooh, do you think it's all in Vic's head? It, it, it is blood's voice, the voice inside Vic's head. <laughs> <laughs> and otherwise, blood is just his dog. <laughs> That's interesting, because I'm trying to think if there's any point that you could say, no, no, Vic wouldn't have known this if it weren't for blood. But you could have, you could easily just say that Vic was just happened to be really lucky or, you know, he was picking up on sounds or sights that he didn't realize. Um, he just didn't notice consciously. Yeah. I like that. That's yeah. interesting. Uh, it, it's something I was thinking through this. I'm like, we're not getting an explanation, and we might not, but the simplest explanation is blood isn't talking. <laughs> <laughs> that is Cause, awesome. Cause you know, he, only Vic hears him in his head. So it's a voice in his head. <laughs> um, I'd almost lay money on that, <laughs> but even even if not, it's still a fun premise. But I like that idea that uh, that blood is just a dog. <laughs> <laughs> it's his dog, and his dog likes him. <laughs> but hence the dog actually attacking another dog to help save him and all that. But uh, mm -hmm. but yeah, like just because we got a comment about. Oh, there's another dog tracking uh, the woman. <laughs> like, is that true? Or did they just happen to come across the YMCA too? <laughs> <laughs> so, so, like, we're, we're taking this at face value, and I don't think you should. I think you should think Vic is just nuts. <laughs> this is how I he's like getting it. through the, the apocalypse. His, his dog is by his side, and he's talking to his dog. <laughs> I like that. I hadn't given that any thought. I'm so thankful that you've mentioned that because yeah. now I, I don't know if I could watch this film and not think that now. <laughs> that's brilliant. Uh, I, I, that's what I'm saying about this film. It, it, it is cheap. It's a rough around the edges. But there's a brilliance in there. The overall design of the world, I think, is pretty pretty awesome and also inspiring the again uh filmmakers have said have cited this film as being inspiration for things like the bad max sure oh absolutely um, especially like beyond thunderdome i think was uh, uh mentioned and in, in, in something i uh, i was reading kind of little things i mean they're filming out in the desert you know in california or arizona i forget exactly where they were yeah you know, civilization as we know it is kind of all still there, but it's been buried by probably decades of nuclear winter. Yeah. And so if you want food and shelter, you got to dig and then you, you find like the roof of the YMCA or you find a roof of a store. Right. Uh, I, I just kind of dug that idea. No pun intended. Because you could do a lot of things. <laughs> you could tell a little bit of a story and do a lot of things without showing much. You see a bunch of guys digging a hole. You don't have to look into the hole, but you see them pulling out groceries. Yep. So you're like, oh, they found a store. You don't have to show it. Right. But you know what's going on. Again, it's a genius way to do a lot with very little. Yes. And then when you do get into like a, a set of like the YMCA... Mm -hmm. You know, they go through all, you know, a hole in the ceiling and they go down. And then when they're in there, there's doorways with, you know, dirt piling up, you know, or, or spilling in. And it's just, it's a great set piece. Mm -hmm. And it obviously was 
used for a shelter. There's cots and, and, and mattresses lying around. There's, there's signs hanging on the wall uh, of uh, kind of saying there was some sort of shelter and that, that indicate that. And it's like, they showed so much without having to say anything. And they even managed to have um, some corpses of various, like they had their fight where they killed uh, invaders into the that particular Y. But there were other bodies in there too, and they were of various different stages of decrepitation. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I'm like, I like that. that it's it's a little thing, but it, it, you 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 knew to do it, and I liked it. I like the screamers or the uh, too expensive for our budget to show <laughs> <laughs> monsters. Right, yeah, the, the notion that you're supposed to, essentially some sort of mutation is out there and they're hunting too. <laughs> yeah, and all you do is hear them. And it, again, sound design and just the idea something's out there. It sounds terrible. These guys are scared to death of it, so they're going to go hide and... We don't need to see it. Nope. It's not part of this story. You just need to know it exists. <laughs> yeah, and it and it works. It's like that's that's okay. Yeah. <laughs> that, you know, like I said, lots of little genius things. It's all in in the details. You don't need a lot of money to do a good job. <laughs> yeah. You just you just have to be a little clever. Yes. And, and this movie is incredibly clever. And there's equally parts that are hard to watch like uh, and it's just because of the world that they're in too the notion that there is a quote-unquote market and they they <laughs> you pay your can good to sit there and watch porn <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah an old an old uh stag film that it, looked awful it, even by stag film yeah standards. like it looked like something recorded in the 40s <laughs> 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 and yeah, yeah there's nothing nothing sexy or interesting about any of it at all and it's all grainy and scratched and all that and and still the guys are paying to be in there and then you get your glimpse of one woman ugliness amongst there but it, it done to good effect yeah yeah i mean our quote-unquote hero yeah is not a good person no but he doesn't right. know how to be either yeah no that's true i mean if you have to like kind of give an excuse to him, yeah, he's he he's had no one to teach him right from wrong. Right. So, oh, sex feels good. I want to have sex. I'm gonna go find someone to have sex with, and that's his motivation. Yep. No, he is a base human. Yeah. I need to eat. I need to sleep, and I need to procreate. But uh, but that's what was kind of interesting about that character too. Is I like. If you actually put yourself in this world, it's not hard to believe a guy like that. No, absolutely not. And again, this film does a pretty decent job of, um, you know, if there's anyone that kind of has like a moral compass, it's blood, yes. the dog. But he is stuck with the, well, I have to eat, so I got to do what I got to do. And if that's hang out with this serial rapist... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. only slightly better than all the other serial rapists because i can try to teach him and hopefully a little bit will will sink in and you get the impression that maybe some of it is because when vic finally catches up to the girl you know he's all ready to to attack her but then there's like a sort of slight hesitation and then that well what's your name you know when she starts talking to him <laughs> yeah and you think i wonder if that's a little bit of blood's influence that he isn't just instead just slapping her around or something right oh yeah yeah, yeah. no no he, he, blood is definitely vic's conscience and attempt at being a better human than just base human a post-apocalyptic Jiminy Cricket. Yeah, basically. <laughs> um, and, and I I wanted to at least bring this up since we are talking about Vic's off-putting personality, uh, yes. to, to say the least, is where you get your... Where you get your first moment is actually 
probably one of the more unsettling things that happens. Uh, you see they're tracking a girl. Um, we are hearing this woman being raped uh, down in the hole that we can't see what's happening. We, Vic is just watching as the various guys run off. And then when he goes down to see what's left, the woman is still alive. She is cut up. She's obviously been raped. And his comments is, they didn't need to cut her. Because he was down there to do the exact same thing. He just didn't yeah, want think, the knife work. Yeah, he says he. they didn't need to cut her. She was at least good for a few more. I don't yeah. It was. It was something, but it was... And it was crude. <laughs> crude and uncomfortable. Yes, no, uh, and I mean, that was... I mean, it's everything in character, but that's the slap in the face that you get. Because you see this pretty pretty boy, young guy, his uh, cute, hairy dog. They're wandering around. You're watching the things. You know it's a post-apocalyptic. But he seems like he's your hero. And then he goes down in that pit, and he is not your hero. <laughs> no, no. He is just mad that they ruined it for everybody else. <laughs> he wasn't there to save the girl. <laughs> yeah, no, this film doesn't have a hero. This film no. is about the world in which the people we follow inhabit. Mm -hmm. That's the point of this movie. This point, the, the, this movie isn't about one person or another, really. No. It's just a sort of a weird commentary of a what if scenario oh i think it's partly morality play too i mean vix your charming one but he is just straight up wrong but when you get to what looks like american society isn't any better <laughs> no and let's talk about the the topeka yes because that's when the the film changes tones significantly Yes, they go down there, and this society has been modeled in some sort of perverse vision of 1950s America. Yes. First of all, everyone's white. Yes. Whether they're actually white or not. Yes, they, they make themselves whiter. <laughs> yes, everyone is in effectively white face. Yes, like clown like white face uh, it, it's pancake makeup it's only from the jaw up mm -hmm. um and it's usually accompanied by a forced painted on smile yes yes you got to be happy everyone's happy or you also have your raggedy ann uh cherry cheeks <laughs> yeah rosy well, cheeks of course. Mm -hmm. but it, they're they're always perfect little red circles you know, they decide that uh, Vic is going to be their, their their stock. Yes. I love the little addition that, you know, they're, they're taking his they're taking his sperm. Yes. No, they're milking him. <laughs> they're milking him. <laughs> yes. And they're going to use it to impregnate dozens of women. But I love that they added in the fact that you you couldn't go and impregnate a woman Unless you can't have a pregnant woman if she's not married. Right. So they do a, a lineup and just have them all marry Vic. Yes. <laughs> while he's strapped to a gurney being milked. <laughs> yes. So I like, that, you know, there's a concession of that polygamy is okay as so long as you don't have unmarried moms. <laughs> yes. Yeah. No, because we, we have to stick to our morality. <laughs> yes. Uh, it it was just a really nice addition to the story. And again, it wasn't like no one said, you know, you have to be married right. in order to do this. It's just it's there, you know, figure it out. <laughs> yeah, no, uh, it, it will. Yeah, it, it slaps you in the face with everything. The whole place is just disturbing from beginning to end because you've constantly got the. Uh, the marching music and the marching band. Somebody's reading a recipe over the loudspeaker constantly, mm -hmm. along with what sounds like rules for living in in Topeka. And all of this is just a constant concophony whenever you're out in an open space, and it's just so unsettling. And, of course, this is uh, led by... Uh 
uh, Jason Robarb's character. Yes. Uh, acclaimed actor, great actor. Mm -hmm. I don't know how he got involved with the film, no. but he definitely adds a little something to it. And it's a brilliant role, which he does with a quite a bit of relish, I think. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I think it it, it, uh, it it was really great uh, seeing an actor of his caliber in a film like this. He's got that right amount of authoritarian and creepy. <laughs> oh, no, absolutely. And then a... <laughs> There seems to be only one punishment if you do anything wrong in Topeka. Yes. It's, and it's to, uh, you are uh, uh, sentenced to the farm, yeah. which means you're dying. Well, yeah, <laughs> it, it, the, the literal, you bought the farm. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and and the, notion, the notion that they are literally playing out that line for real. Mm -hmm. But then you kind of love the addition of Michael. M Michael is the name of their farmer. <laughs> and he's a robot. <laughs> yeah, yes, as we find out. <laughs> In the weirdest of ways we end up finding out. But uh, Which is why I'm going to go ahead and inject Fallout here at this stage. Please, yeah, you're more familiar with the. You've yeah. watched the show. I've had a chance to see the show, I, and yeah, I've watched the show. I'm familiar with the game. I've never played the game, but I mean, again, it the concept is post-apocalyptic world. We've managed to nuke ourselves, um, so the world is unraveling in a few different ways. Uh, the, the way that it happens is when, by the time the bombs have gone off, at least in, I, I believe this parallels the game, but the in the show. Uh, it's actually 2077 in a world that is still very much patterned off the 50s. Go figure. <laughs> um, and then 200 plus years later, uh, we're, we, we're thrown ahead to a world where there are people that are living in the, uh, the fallout shelters. Um, and th in there, it is very Topeka-like. Um, in the in the bunkers, they are trying to live out the American dream, and they're trying to survive long enough to revive America on, on the ground above. Um, but no, uh, similarly, in, in this show, in Fallout, there are notions on reproduction. Uh, if you're in your shelter, you only have so many people in your shelter, and there's more than one shelter. So... You have to go get other husbands and or wives from other things. And in this series, that's where the disaster starts to ensue because one of them was taken over. Um, so they've let bad influence into the shelter. But so our main character then has to go above, which is very much like the world that we see in this movie, uh, where it's just kind of desolate. But there are people and they're eking out very rudimentary lives either murdering one another or uh, trying to trade with whatever they can still scrounge out of the destroyed world around them so this parallels this so closely that you actually looking that up makes my day because <laughs> I'm like it's seriously like watching this and since we're going to have very loose connections between um this 2024 in the movie and our world, because we we are hap happily for now, happily not in post-apocalyptic world. Um, but where I am going to draw the similarity is that Fallout connection, because this was created in 1975, and apparently was some of the uh, inspiration for the Fallout game. It's kind of fun. That the year that this movie says it takes place in is the year that the series comes out. Yeah. <laughs> so. There you go. So. Yep. Yes, it predicted the future. <laughs> <laughs> it just did it in the entertainment world. Here, look at the new version of what we did in 1975. <laughs> yep. Yeah, there is no... I don't have any notes on, you know, what they got right or wrong. This was, I think, just a sort of a, uh, right. a, a personal interest in watching the film. And it was close enough to our theme yes. that we, we fit it in. 
Yes, and, and well, and this one stretches it anyways because it is an alternate reality. But again, I can parallel that to the Fallout series. That is an alternate Earth. That is not us specifically. Right. So it, there are similar. I, I, I just kind of love. I now I want to go talk to a showrunner for Fallout and go. Is the timing on any of this anyway related to that? movie (laughs) I just kind of want to know because just like my suggestion that blood is just Vic's internal voice this is too good to almost not be real (laughs) yeah no it'd be that's a hell of a coincidence kind of so I just stretch it I I like I'm just gonna live with it that this was on purpose (laughs) Yeah, it would be great to have a little roundtable with the creator of the Fallout video game and the showrunners of the Fallout TV series and us and talk about this movie. Right, yeah, no. <laughs> please, please tell us how much did you... <laughs> but yes, no, amazing. Uh, I, 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 the, I can't wait to catch up on the rest of Fallout. I'm thrilled that it's going to have a second season and if this was the birth of that then it then i love this even more yeah yeah i think on the surface this is a weird film it's definitely weird (laughs) it is not a film for everybody Uh, this is definitely not a film that i would recommend to just anyone to go check out (laughs) it's not a date film either (laughs) no definitely not a date film but yeah, this is. I think you 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 said it best. Where you could watch this, and at the end of it, going, well, that was a hour and whatever wasted time. What the hell did I sit through? And then the next day, you start thinking, huh? Yeah. <laughs> and, and, and seriously, that when I finished watching this this past weekend, I, I seriously thought, eh, we'll have a little fun bagging on this. And then by the next day, I'm like wait a minute, I actually kind of like that. I think I like this. Right. And then the more I thought about it, the more I'm like, no, this was good. Like, this was really good. I think this film was actually a hell of a lot more intelligent. Yes. Does that make it a good movie? Uh, you know, again, in my depending head on your space, definition. Yes. Good, good and intelligent go together. I, 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 I'll take intelligent over pretty all the time. No, it, it's difficult to describe this uh, anyways, because, yes, it is rough. It's it, it's 1975. It's got some unknowns in it or that are just coming up. The, it, it, could there be a little bit more to the script? Maybe. Um, did we need certain elements over others? Maybe. Um, but did it still come off uh, as a thoughtful execution? Absolutely. And I'm not going to spoil the end. You're not? No. I don't know. Do you want to actually talk about the, the, the very end of this film? It, it's kind of the one thing that really solidifies it as a comedy. <laughs> it's dark. <laughs> it's real damn dark. But but the execution of the last scene is actually just brilliant. All right. Well, spoilers yep. ahead, folks. If you haven't seen this film, and if we've given you any interest in watching it, if you have, then pause the show here. Yes. Go watch it, and then come back and listen to the rest. You've been warned. Yes. <laughs> yeah. the 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 final moments of this movie, I think, are just this great whip your head around and go wait what <laughs> <laughs> moment. Yes. But it does. You're right. You said solidify. That solidifies whether I think you enjoy this film or not. If you come away from that ending and go, that's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and admittedly, even though I had some misgivings about watching it, that scene was amazing. <laughs> I, I, I laughed. <laughs> so in the end, Vic and Quilla return to the surface. Yep. They're now cut off from down under. They find Blood, who's near death. Yes, he's been waiting the entire time. Mm-hmm. Uh, he's, he's injured. He's, he's eaten almost nothing. They need food for him. They don't know how to or what to do. And Quilla tries to convince Vic to just leave him. 
I mean, mm-hmm. Blood tells him, you know, I'm done for. Go on without me. Yeah. Quilla tells Vic, we need to leave. Even, you know, let's go. I mean, I love you. If you love me, if you know what love is, you'll you'll come with me. Oh, and keep in mind, just minutes before telling him she loves him, uh, she just got done telling him, I used you. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so uh, minutes have passed. This is not <laughs> it's not like a couple right. of days to settle this in. <laughs> but that scene cuts, and then the next thing you see is Vic and Blood walking away. Blood has been bandaged up with what looks to be uh, strips of what Quilla was wearing. Yes. Quilla is nowhere to be found. Nope. But there's a smoldering fire. Blood and Vic are talking about how full they are mm. <laughs> as they walk away. Well, and even Blood makes some some joke. Yeah, and so they begin to walk away. Blood thanks Vic for the food, and they make a comment about Quilla. Vic says that it was her own fault that she shouldn't have followed him. And Blood jokes, well, that she had marvelous judgment but did not have particularly good taste. And then they laugh as they walk away. Yeah. <laughs> With the idea... They ate her! They, <laughs> they ate her! They ate her! Vic chose blood over Quilla. <laughs> and, and, and it was just... It was fitting because, well, one, she was, a t- she was an awful person, too. <laughs> Everybody, everybody in this movie is an awful, awful person. There is nobody left in, in humanity that seems even remotely right in any way, shape, or form. So, and since our hero is not a hero, which we learned at the beginning of the film, let's just go ahead and grind that in the rest of the way at the end of the film. <laughs> because <laughs> uh, the only the part that aside from the magnificent joke about her uh, lack of good taste <laughs> yes but aside from that it, it's also the it's fitting for the the title of the film a boy and his dog uh he is there for his dog he has saved his dog and he has sacrificed regular on the go <laughs> so to speak <laughs> Uh, so that he can save his buddy. <laughs> it brings a tear to your eye, sort of. <laughs> Apparently, uh, Harlan Ellison, while he said he, he loved the film, yeah. he, he, he thought this is exactly the way it should, you know, from, from book to film. He, he thought this was great. Yeah. Um, Apparently, he did make comments that he didn't like that final line. Oh, yeah. He thought it was a little too crass. <laughs> yeah. But his book doesn't end any differently. Right. In the novella, uh, the last lines in this particular story, uh, Vic is kind of remembering back to a question that Quilla asked him at some point, do you know what love is? And he concludes, sure I know. A boy loves his dog. (laughs) (laughs) That's cute too. Uh Uh-huh. But I, I like blood. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The whole movie's a bit crass. Dark. I kind of like the dark humor that, that, that they, they went with. Yeah, I mean, everything about this is off. And <laughs> so that was, it was just icing on the cake. It just says, we know who we are. We're going out that way. <laughs> well, I think the, um, Ellison continues in that, interview that he would he would talk in about that line he's like yeah i didn't really like the line but that was something that was put in by lq jones and he obviously knew the market better yeah because he, he recognized that everyone else loved it yeah so you know all right i didn't like it but everyone else likes it so fine <laughs> i like that he didn't let it ruin his experience <laughs> yeah apparently he joins in um him and I think LQ Jones, I think the two of them, uh, there's an interview with them. You can get this on a, a DVD or a Blu-ray. There's a commentary with them on it. I kind of have to dig that up, I think. <laughs> well, and, and even while I got IMDb up, I'm uh, marveling at the, 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 the uncredited part where LQ Jones was one of the actors in one of the porn films. 
Yes. <laughs> hey, if you're gonna do it, if you're gonna do an Alfred Hitchcock, man, do it right. <laughs> you gotta love that touch, though. <laughs> no, I am awesome. I'm so happy that you enjoyed this. I was a little concerned what you'd think about it. <laughs> no, I I was too. <laughs> I mean it. it uh, I mean, any looking at any preview, and, and especially like I was commenting on the IMDb page, where it looks like they're running something that came out of a drive-in movie theater, um, so it's all grainy and stuff. So I like okay, uh, I get we'll watch this, and that's what I love about doing this show with you. Anyways, is it it, it forces me out of my comfort zone. If I had saw a boy and his dog, and even read the thing, I'd go. Eh. Maybe, but nah, I'd move on pretty quickly. Now, now mm-hmm. I'm thrilled that I saw this film. I'm just double checking, and I found a library that has this Blu-ray, and I am borrowing it as I <laughs> as we speak. <laughs> Boom. Okay, yeah, borrowed. It's on a, two weeks from now. I'm going to be watching this commentary. <laughs> well, we did not get any social media comments. <laughs> While this film is rated highly everywhere you look, Mm -hmm. IMDb, Rotten Tomatoes, it still seems to be a little obscure. So I'm not surprised we didn't get any comments on it. But uh, did you were you able to find any uh, critiques from the era? Absolutely. In fact, interestingly enough, just doing a a quick scan of Metacritic when they'd get ratings and base them on a zero through one hundred scale. Uh, the lowest in this was a 50. Yeah, it, it, it sta- uh, uh, the overall average on Metacritic uh, based on whatever their criteria is for boiling these down to numbers, but it, it went out at a 68. So for for a, <laughs> a, a, a dopey little sci-fi movie from, the, from 75 with a low budget, that's pretty amazing. Absolutely. Uh, but... I pulled out three in particular uh, to uh, go over. Uh, I'll start with uh, Entertainment Weekly, J.R. Taylor. And actually, this particular critique was from 1995. (laughs) But uh, I guess there was some sort of re-release of some kind for the film. Uh, At least that's what it described in the little snippet. But it says, Though the film may not have one decent character... Mm-hmm. A Boy and His Dog, re-released after six years moratorium, so that's that comment, manages to be a likable celebration of friendship among the ruins. <laughs> okay. That's, that, that's an interpretation. <laughs> yeah, that's, uh, yeah. I think you gotta look, I mean, it's there. It's there, but that, 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 that you, you have scratched the surface. <laughs> Very minutely. <laughs> that that is overlooking everything about this film and going, oh, but it's about this wonderful relationship between a guy and his dog. <laughs> yeah, uh, th- this whole uh, critique was all of a paragraph long, so right. that that was the best out of that. Um, and then our friend Roger Ebert, uh, while working for Chicago Sun Times, um, he writes. The movie's about eccentrics, especially the dog who turns out to be very eccentric, and Jones, Vic, uh, seems to have a feel for that. The movie doesn't uh, look or sound like most sci-fi tours of alternate un- futures. Alternative futures. It's got a unique, well, I was about to say charm, but the movie's last scene doesn't quite let me get away with that. <laughs> uh, I love it. Uh, and, uh, interestingly enough, this was considered a, a, a fairly high uh, um, critique, but he only gave it two and a half stars. Well, out of five? I don't even know if they... Uh, is he a five or a four rating? I can't remember what Roger did. I think there were five. It may have been I five. It's, it's, ha- five it's halfway, so that's not bad. Yeah. Um, and then the last one I got was from, of all things, TV Guide, and uh, only staff writer <laughs> was uh, credited. So these two characters referencing uh, Vic and Blood 
These two characters care about each other quite a lot to the exclusion of anyone else. Yet from its obviously ironic, ironically intended title to its wickedly funny sick joke of an ending, in, in which <laughs> and then it literally describes in which Quilla June's fate is conveyed entirely through conversation between Vic and Blood, it's clear that sentimentality is far from Jones' mind. His dialogue is frequently sharp and witty. His framing and staging are inventive, and he conveys a sense of future desolation quite well, with a scavenger-oriented production design that anticipated the Mad Max films and their many imitators. The movie loses some of its momentum when Vic heads down under. However, while still visually interesting, the scenes in the underground are more conventional, and the wit of Vic and Blood's conversations is missed. Thus, it is doubly a relief when Vic escapes back to the surface and the film delivers that perfect punchline. So... <laughs> <laughs> So, yeah, uh, going from a review that barely touches on anything to want, uh, both really digging that last little bit. <laughs> Overall, this is a very well-received movie, given given what it is and what it had to have cost to make. <laughs> yeah, I didn't actually look to see what the budget was on this, but I'm sure it was pennies compared to, uh, to certainly to modern films or even current films of the time. Estimated budget was 400000 I believe it. Yeah. <laughs> and it is, I tell you what, that's 400000 but all that 400000 is on the screen. It, it, no, uh, 100%. Yeah, absolutely, because it's, uh, it's between the actors and the caliber of actors that they got and location. Location, yeah. location, location. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was brilliant. It yeah, the more I think about it and the more I talk about it, the more I like this film. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, like I thought seriously after watching that that I was going to struggle to say anything nice about it, and now I can't shut up about it. <laughs> I went into it expecting something along the lines of some other, you know, early and mid 70s sci fi and horror. Some we've watched, I, mm-hmm. you know. We, we watch, like, Werewolves on Wheels. Yes. And, you know, <laughs> um, there's the film I watched, uh, Gas. Uh, there is the the one I was struggling to find before we started recording. The, the, what, what did I say it was? The Curse of the Headless Horseman. Yes, which which doesn't sounds happen. way cooler than the film actually is. But they're all just very shoestring budget, someone had a camera and a bunch of friends kind of movies. And I thought this was going to be a little bit like that. Oh, yeah. And I think this is maybe a little step above. I was even anticipating kind of an exploitation film from the era that Mm -hmm. it was so Mm -hmm. known for. And and it's so pleasantly surprised when it wasn't. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, there's definitely some scenes in here that was... uh, would help get people their, their butts oh, in sure, the seat. Oh, sure, sure, yeah. <laughs> there, there, there was some decent nudity, uh, but given the way that this was structured, I can't call it gratuitous necessarily. It worked with the plot. Yes. There's a reason. She she was, as as Jason Robarb's character put it, she was the cheese yeah. to bring in their, their mouse. And so there's a reason why she decided to get undressed in the middle of this. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Hellscape YMCA. Yeah, exactly. Uh, no, but even anywhere else it was introduced, if it was, um, it wasn't for titillation. It was to put you no. off. <laughs> yeah. No. No, a, a very much more intelligent film than I think anyone would realize <laughs> going into it. And yet it is one that I encourage you to watch and stew on. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. Let that simmer. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, I think that'll do it mm-hmm. for a boy and his dog. I'm so glad we I finally got around yes. to watching this film. Yes, so much better than I think we anticipated. Uh, very much. Uh, next time, uh, again, 
we're going to whirlwind around and change gears one more time. We're going to jump to 1993 and watch a film that I don't think we could have possibly missed in this series. <laughs> no. We're going to watch Demolition Man. Woohoo! Uh, made in uh, released in 1993, takes place in 1996 and 2032. So it's a little far out of our usual, you know, uh, time frame. But again, I mean, it's a movie that predicts a future that is just worth talking about. Yes, and that future's in spinning distance. So get your exactly. Taco Bell now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think we'll definitely talk about uh, that because. I think we'll be a little surprised in the versions we watch in currently uh, streaming. Yep. Anyway, folks, that is going to do it for this episode. If anyone has seen A Boy and His Dog and didn't get a chance to comment and would like to, or if you've watched this film after listening to us talk about it, please write us and let us know what you think of the film, timeshifterspodcast at gmail.com, or follow the link in the show notes to any of our social media sites and drop us a message or comment on any post there. We will talk to everybody in a couple weeks. Thanks for listening, everyone. Bye. See ya.